You're listening to ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia, and I'm sitting in the office of the physics professor Alex Valenkin at Tufts University. I have his new book open. It's called Many Worlds in One, The Search for Other Universes. And as I read it, I learn that there's another Jenny Atia, in fact, an infinite number of us, holding this same book in this same office with the same Alex Valenkin. Did I get that right, Alex? Precisely. <laughs> You are the director of the Institute of Cosmology here at Tufts, and you have resources at your disposal. How is your search for other universes going? Well, it is, uh, it's going pretty well, I should say. Unfortunately, we cannot travel to other universes because they are too far away. Actually, even light cannot travel to them, so they are causally disconnected from us. We cannot influence anything that is happening there, and uh, the inhabitants cannot influence us. However, we can look for indirect evidence for the existence of these universes, and this is what we are trying to do here. Give me an idea of what that would look like, indirect evidence. What kind of indirect evidence are you looking for? Well, much of it is necessarily theoretical, much of the work involved here. So this whole research is based on the new picture of the universe that has emerged from recent work in cosmology. And it turns out, according to this picture, that our universe is a much bigger place than we thought it is. We can see only a small part of the universe, which is set by the distance light could travel since the Big Bang. And uh, you cannot help wondering what is beyond that. And until recently, people thought, well, it's more of the same. It's more stars, more galaxies. But according to this new picture, distant parts of the universe are strikingly different from what we have around here. And some of these parts are even characterized by different laws of physics, with different constants of nature, as we call them, like gravitational constant that determines the strength of gravity and so forth. So we develop a theory to understand how these different properties are distributed in the universe and try to, from there, predict what we are likely to observe here in our local region. When you think about other universes and when you're working towards developing theories about what's out there, what do you imagine in your mind? What are these uh, geometrical shapes? Well, basically, you can ask, what, what does this universe, uh, big universe, looks like with, with all these different regions? And basically, much of it is in the state of explosive accelerated expansion, which is called inflation. And regions like ours, where inflation ended, are constantly being formed. And they're like islands in this inflating sea. So when we do this computer simulation, this is what it looks like. It looks like archipelago uh, with a kind of the sea, which represents inflating part of the universe. And in it, there are these islands, which once formed are rapidly expanding but the distances between them are growing even faster. And this opens up new space for new little islands to form, which also start expanding. So with this archipelago of yours in your imagination, where are the other Alex Valenkins, and why do you believe they're out there? Well, um, let's see. We, we, have the, uh, we live in one of these islands in the archipelago, and this island keeps growing. So it will continue growing forever. So it will become infinite. And in it, there will be an infinite number of galaxies. And therefore, there will be an infinite number of regions like the one we can observe. We call them O regions, right? the observable region. The key point here is that the number of possible histories that can happen in a given O region in a finite amount of time is finite. It's a huge number but it is a finite number. You might think that you could change things slightly. For example, I move my chair, say one centimeter, and I have another history. I can move it half centimeter, yet another history, and apparently I can have an infinite number of histories right there. But according to quantum mechanics, histories that are very close to one another cannot be told apart, cannot be distinguished from one another, even in principle. So you have a finite number of histories, which we estimated, it's 10 to the power, 10 to the power 150. It's an incredible, unimaginably large number. However, you have an infinite number of regions where this finite number of histories are being played out. Inevitably, all histories that have a non-zero probability to happen will happen, and they will happen an infinite number of times. Therefore, we are having this conversation in many 
different parts of our island universe and in other islands as well. Alex Valenkin, what is it like for you to think that there are a whole bunch of other Alex Valenkins running around out there experiencing what you experience, thinking what you think? Um, well, actually, I got very depressed about this. I didn't like it at all. And the most upsetting thing about it is kind of the loss of uniqueness. That uh, you may think that our civilization here is good or bad, but at least it is uh, unique, you would think, and we should treasure it like you would treasure a work of art. But uh, if you are told that, you know, there is an infinite number of things exactly like that, it's kind of depressing. Um, so what happened after you were depressed? What did you do? Where did you go from there, intellectually? Well, it's not that I did much. Uh, I told, I discussed this with people and I noticed that everybody has different reactions. Some people thought it was fine. They said, okay, there are many places much better than uh, we have here. Some suggested that I should practice Buddhism, that it would help. One thing that I found uh, interesting is there is a, uh, one fellow that I know who is a biologist and um, he told me that basically that the origin of life is not a very well understood thing and that uh, it appears that it, is an it requires some extremely unlikely event to occur. And he said that, well, maybe in the entire visible universe, not in the entire multiverse, which of course is um, infinite, maybe there is uh, no other intelligent life. So in that case, we may feel at least somewhat special and feel some responsibility for our part of the universe. You're listening to ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atiyah, and I'm speaking with the physicist Alex Vilenkin. This is a layman's question, and you've probably been asked it far too many times in your life, but if our universe is infinite and expanding, how could there possibly be room for some other universe <laughs> to fit in and expand infinitely as well. Where would it fit? Yeah, well, th this, is a, this is a very good question. It is, it is not easy to picture this. Basically, this apparent discrepancy is due to the different notions of time that are more suitable in, when you try to view the universe from different angles. When you say that the, whether the universe is finite or infinite, or say if you ask what is the shape of the universe, is it uh, flat infinite space as uh, people thought uh, for a long time, or maybe it closes on itself as a sphere, you're asking about its shape at a given moment of time. Right? So time is crucial here. And uh, if you take one of these islands in the archipelago, at what time are we measuring the size of this island? If you want to take a global point of view, you want to see the whole inflating sea with all these islands, then each of the islands is finite and it's growing. But now suppose we are inside one of the islands, then the most natural choice of time is from the Big Bang. And the Big Bang is kind of happening all the time at the boundaries of the island as it expands into this inflating sea. So if you look at the island in its entirety, and you say, at every point, we start counting at the Big Bang, then the island becomes infinite. And from this point of view, this island is totally self-contained, and inflation is in your past. It's not, you cannot travel from the island to the inflating sea, just as you cannot travel to the past. Uh, these are very mind-twisting properties of Einstein's theory of gravitation, which is a curved space-time, and it takes... Uh, a bit to get used to. Speaking of the past and of time, Alex Valenkin, you have gone back in time before the Big Bang and asked the question, how did the Big Bang start? What fueled it? And you've come up with a very interesting idea of the non-existence of time. Before the creation of anything, there was no space or matter. And if there's no space or matter, there's nothing that can happen in a period of time. So that therefore, we are going back to a timeless period of time. <laughs> Tell me, put it in your own words, <laughs> please. <laughs> well, you're talking about the creation of the universe. This is the question of how inflation started. How it all started. How it all started. <laughs> and when this idea of eternal inflation came up, some people thought that this is very good, now we don't have to worry about how everything started. 
if inflation is eternal to the future, then maybe it is also eternal to the past. And so this is what's going on forever. So we don't have to worry about the beginning, which is a very thorny question for physicists. However, it turns out that you cannot extend inflation to the infinite past. We proved a theorem to that effect with uh, Arvind Border and Alan Guth, which shows that this is impossible, so there must be, have been a beginning. And then the question is what kind of beginning that was. If Even before I start answering, you can tell, okay, and, 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 and I'll ask you what happened before that. Um, but you're